I greet you in the name of Jesus Christ. My name is Israel and today I'm doing the topic of Spark Part 11. This is a continuation of my testimony. Uh, my life is a testimony, so I'm explaining all the events of my life. Um, and and now I'm at uh, the section where, or the, 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 the time of my life, where I am moved, where I moved from uh, the beauty therapy to working in the ECD, early childhood development, daycare, crash, play school, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's basically from uh, three to uh, three to five years or three to um, six years of age, going up to grade R. Um, and so that's just the little ones uh, that we look after in the center. Um, I worked at a couple of daycares um, and some of the stuff I expose uh, in the daycares that I've worked, but I'm not specifying any particular daycare. Um, I'm just um, expressing things that I've I, I experienced and things that I saw. Um, just to bring to light, to bring to the light what is also hidden in the dark. Um, because there are things that happen in the daycare that nobody talks about. Everybody wants to show their face that they are the perfect person to take care of your child um, because people when they leave their child with somebody they want that security that trust and assurance that they are leaving their child in a safe healthy and good environment and so this uh, need that the market has, that the parents have, is a need that the entrepreneur, that the business owner, wants to meet. So the business owner is not going to expose the dark things that's happening in their business. They are only going to speak about all that is wonderful and all that is good because they want to build a good reputation for their daycare and they want people to bring their child to their daycare by word of mouth being the best form of advertisement. Um, other measures of advertisement um, have been used in different daycares. Uh, some daycares advertise on Facebook. Some daycares have um, their own website they have other marketing strategies but at the end of the day um, most people will bring their child because of somebody that they know is taking their child to this particular daycare and this mother is saying no that's a that's a good daycare that mother gives a good reference for that daycare that mother speaks highly or that dad speaks highly of that daycare. And so within the cliques, within the social groups, within the churches, within the wherever, uh, where they're brying or where they are coming together, people meet people and they're like, I'm taking my child to this daycare. It's a very good daycare. And they, they that word of mouth is what the business owner depends on, a good reputation for their daycare, a, a good 
word of mouth report about their daycare. So if there's a complaint that the business owner receives, the principal, if there is a complaint, if there is an issue, if there is a problem, it's like a red flag. This complaint needs to be resolved in such a way that the parent calms down and is reassured and satisfied that their child is in good hands. Honestly, it's a very highly pressurized expectation from the parents that absolute, absolutely nothing must ever go wrong whilst their child is under the care or the carers of the daycare because something can go wrong in your own home. Even you as a parent, and you can be a wonderful parent, a loving parent, a caring parent, a careful parent, a vigilant parent. You can be an educated parent, a parent that has knowledge, that has done homework, that has done research, that has done everything in their possible ability to be the best mother for your child and something can still go wrong because a child will always be a child and sometimes children play and sometimes children do silly things and while she's busy cooking or while she are busy cleaning your house or while she are busy working in the garden or else you're even outside in the garden with your child, digging out the weeds or something, something can go wrong in a blink of an eye. It happens so fast. And it can happen in your own home. But if it happens in your own home, everything is like, oh, you know, when the parents meet their friends or their family members, oh, you know, my little boy who was playing on his skateboard and then he fell and now look, he's got this and he landed on his hand because he was, um, he went down too fast and you know, it happened so quickly and next minute I see my child fell and he was crying and now he's got this big mark on his wrist, how the, how, how the, the ground did scrape it. And oh, I had to oh, comfort him because he was crying and everything like that. And they're like, oh, you know, oh, children will be children. Oh, I'm so sorry this happened to you today. And um, let me just, and I'm so sorry this happened to you today. And uh, and the mother's like, yeah, it wasn't nice. And I, I had to check. I thought maybe he even did break his arm. But if that happens in the daycare, it's like unforgivable. It's like, yo, I'm going to take my child out of this daycare. I'm going to take him to another daycare because these people don't know what they're doing. And there's this high pressure on teachers, on daycare carers, on the principal that absolutely nothing must ever go wrong. Because if something goes wrong, you get those parents that don't understand that that can be a possibility. It's like, I can't understand it. How did this happen? And then you 
because of the pressure, what happens in the deck here, now the teacher must go apologize or the person who was under the care of the child needs to write a report, put it in a book, put the time and the date, must go to uh, uh, the, the parent, apologize, explain everything what happened in detail, um, and just assure the parent, you know, it was an accident and things like that. Um, but still on top of all of that, you get parents that will still take their child out of the daycare and the principal loses a child, which means the principal now loses income. Um, I've, I've, I've had uh, children that scratch their own face when they're sleeping. And their nails are too long. Um, but at the same time, the carer doesn't want to take the responsibility of clipping the nails at school because what if you nip the child whilst clipping their nails? Then the parent's going to complain because you nip the child while clipping their nails. So to avoid that complaint, um, it's like, no, let's leave it up to the parents to clip the nails. And then you don't clip the nails, then that's also a problem because then when they're sleeping during nap time, Whilst they're sleeping, they can scratch their own face. It has happened where children fight and they get in a bad argument and they scratch another child's face on purpose. It has happened. But I want to ask you, how is the carer, how is the teacher going to prevent that from happening because it happens so fast. We're busy in the class, busy playing with Legos. This one took that one's Lego. This child took that child's Lego. Now because that child took the other child's Lego, the other child got angry and scratches his face. How? But the carer is there. The teacher said, how fast must the teacher move to prevent that scratch from happening? Then, when you give the child to the parent, you must explain what happened. You have to write it down. You have to write the date and the time in your, in your report book and explain to the parent, you know, the scratch, what happened. They were playing Lego, and then the parents like, I don't like the school. The school is too rough. Why do, why do you allow children to bully my child? Why do you allow your, your children to, to attack my child? What kind of a carer, what kind of a teacher are you to allow bullying in your class? So much pressure on the educators, so much pressure on the teachers, and they are trying their best. As it is, they are trying their best to eliminate the bullying and the fighting by telling stories, by counseling, um, repetitive uh, uh, instructions to play nicely, don't fight, to, 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 to counsel their mind to be calm, but children will still be children at the end of the day. Children are not perfect. Adults are not perfect. Nobody can ever be perfect all the time. Someone's going to get angry. Sometimes the children get angry. Sometimes the children, because they're still children, they don't know how to deal with their anger. And they can do something. But I don't understand why. Um, and if a child is bullying another child, that child will face the consequences. That child will be spoken to. And, uh, and uh, you will explain to the child, this is not how to deal 
with somebody, if they, if they take your Lego, you don't scratch them in the face. Then you take the child, you remove the child, you put the child in the naughty corner, but you don't, you just put the child in the corner. Because words, you cannot project words on children and say it's a naughty corner and give them a psychological image of themselves of being bad. So everything is very technical and everything you do, you must do it with insight and depth and understanding because you're dealing with a small mind, you're dealing with a small human being, you're dealing with a spirit, that child has a spirit, that child has feelings, that child is in a world of his own and you have to go down to that child's level to understand from the child's perspective what is happening. This child took my Lego. I'm angry. So everything is not always about you bad, you this, you that. You have to also understand from a child's perspective what's happening. And also allow the child to work out the consequences for their behavior in a constructive way that's not destructive to their psyche and emotions. So it's very technical, but you, you deal with parents that can't understand any of this. And then they go out there and they speak badly about the school, and but they themselves are not the perfect parents. Because when you see them on Facebook, on their, on their, um, on their WhatsApp, uh, what do you call that thing? You see pictures of them doing this and doing that. They're not the best role mo models for their children either. They're not doing it perfectly either. They're also falling short. But when they bring their child to the school, everybody must be perfect. The child must be perfect. The other children must be perfect. The carers must be perfect. The principal, this is the expectation of the parents because they are paying school fees. So everything must be perfect. And that's not a realistic mindset or expectation to have on child carers. It's not realistic. It's a deception. And it's unnecessary pressure. Um, so because of this pressure, there's a darkness that comes into the school. I'm not talking about any specific daycare I've work, worked in, but I'm talking about daycares in general that I've worked in, that I've been exposed to, um, and different things happened in different daycares. Not all of them in the same daycare. I'm not talking about one specific daycare. I'm just spreading it out. What happened here, what happened there. And just exposing a bit about the darkness that creeps into a daycare because of the pressure the parents put on the principal and the teachers and the, the, the carers of the children. Um, I've worked in daycares where uh, I've worked, I've worked, worked in, I've, I've been exposed to daycares where some of them, not all of them, experience this pressure of parents complaining. They can't handle the complaints all the time. It's so stressful for them. And because they're under the stress and pressure, the principal now is afraid for children to play. Okay? Because if they play, they might get hurt. If they play... On the jungle gym, they might fall and bump their knee. If they play, they might trip and fall and scrape their hand. If they play, 
they might bump their head. So now we don't want accidents because when there's an accident, we have to write it in the report and then we have to explain it to the parent and then we have to calm the parent down and we don't want to lose children. We don't want to lose money and the parent might take the child away to another school and talk badly about the school to other people and then we lose other children from coming to our school. So now we minimize the playing. They must sit still. So they don't actually play outside. This is the sad reality. They stay inside. Because we don't want them to get hurt. We want to minimize the, the, the cases of injury. So they stay inside. They stay in their classroom. Um, they are kept busy. Um, doing work, basically. So they work more. The playing thing is kind of like taken away. And they can't play outside. Um, and so they just do more like work, coloring in and just being inside, maybe building a, a Lego or um, building a trying to build a puzzle, um, listening to a story from storytelling. So, and they must sit still. They must sit still on their chair. I mean, on their, yeah, on their chair by their little table with their other friends next to them. They must sit by their table. They must sit and draw. They must sit and paint. They must sit and do their Play-Doh. They must sit and do their Lego. They must sit the whole day and be quiet. They mustn't make too much noise. And they mustn't get too excited to keep everybody calm. Because when there's excitement, there might be an accident and somebody might get hurt. Because when children play, what happens also is when they play, they can get into an argument and they can fight. So everything has to be calm. Now it's time to get up, to go to the toilet. <gasps> There's some movement. I'm free from this, from this chair and this table. And now this excitement builds up. Because they are going, they're moving to the toilet for toilet routine. And now they get naughty in the line. And then they get told, be quiet. You're in the line. Stand in a straight line. These are rules that are in, uh, uh, put in place by the principal. Who wants everything to be calm all the time. The children must be calm. Everything must be calm. The line must be calm. So now, keep quiet. Keep quiet. Stand in line. Put your hands behind your back. Make a neat line. So now they are still confined and still restricted from having freedom because we don't want injuries. We don't want them to get too excited. They're not allowed to fight. Because if they fight, the one might push the other one and he might fall down and bump his head. So everything else must be calm. And then, that's the fear that the principal has that, that she now puts these rules onto the teachers and carers, and now everybody must follow the principal's rules of the school. 
and she will, the principal will walk around to check if everything is according to her rules. And if it's not, the teacher gets into trouble, the carer gets into trouble. Control your children. If you are a good teacher, you will have them under control. So everything just goes into this control mode. And they're inside the whole day because they're not actually going outside to go climb the trees, to climb the jungle gym, to slide, to kick the ball because we don't want them to fall and graze their knee or something. They can't have a bruise. They can't get a scratch. They can't bump their head. They can't bump their mouth. They can't do anything. Nothing must go wrong with them because of the fear that the parent will take the child out of the school. This is what's happening. I'm not saying it's happening in all the daycares. It's happening in some of them. Please get me right. So some of the daycares are doing this. And then, uh, after their toilet routine, they go back to their little table their little chairs where they sit down. Now they can eat. So the, the educator teacher brings them their food. And now it's time to eat. But you only have so much time to eat. Because you must follow the daily routine strictly and religiously. Some children eat faster. Some children take very long to eat. Some children don't want to eat. Some, some children refuse to eat. When that 15 minutes is up, The food gets packed away back in the in their in their bags. During whilst they are eating, some principals will be because they want everything calm and relaxed, not talking while you eat. So now you must be quiet when you're eating. You must be quiet when you're standing in the line. You must be quiet when you're drawing. You must be quiet when you're painting. You must be quiet the whole day. Because when you talk too much, it's like that's too much excitement for the principal. And I don't like that because children must talk. They must engage whilst they're busy doing things. You can't be so quiet the whole day. You, you're even supposed to be learning to speak at that age. Not just listening. You must be practicing your speech. So I don't like children to be quiet the whole day. That's one of the things I don't like about some of the places I've worked, is that I, my children must be quiet the whole day. It's so frustrating. And that they must sit still and be inside and just do their little things of painting and drawing and puzzle and Lego, and they must just be quiet the whole day. It's not nice. So what is happening also is that by the second um, break, that's the first break, by the second break, whatever the child didn't eat, this is what's happening, not in all daycares, in some daycares, whatever the child didn't eat, gets thrown in the bin. Why? Because parents complain if their children didn't finish their food. This is the pressure the parents are putting on the teachers and the educators and the principal. If their child doesn't finish their food, If their child doesn't want to eat 
And you can't force feed a child that doesn't want to eat. If you force feed a child that doesn't want to eat, that child's going to vomit. And then you're going to clean up the vomit. I have tried to force feed a child. And I don't like it. Because the child vomits. And because you only have so much time to eat, the child vomits because he can't finish his food in time because he can't eat so fast. This is where the darkness comes in to the, the school. This is where the darkness comes into the daycare. Because parents insist that the children must finish all their food. Now, some of the parents are giving too much food for their child to finish. Maybe this child is two years old or three years old and has has two um, four slices of bread with beef and cheese and uh, three yogurts and a banana and a little Tupperware with rice and stew and a fruit salad i'm not i'm not I, i'm serious i'm telling you the truth and they want this child to finish all of that food i've had like a three-year-old that have big hot dogs but with the with the buddhavosh inside the big big buddhavosh the big fat buddhavosh inside big hot dogs two big hot dogs On top of that, yogurt. On top of that, a banana. On top of that, an apple. On top of that, something else like um, a fruit salad. And a big and a, and a packet of chips. And a nachi. And this child's three. And you have only so much time to eat in the morning, so much time to eat in the afternoon. The child can't finish it. The parent complains. The parent complains. Every time the parent's complaining, and I've even had that the parent take the child out of the school, complaining that the teacher is not feeding their child. When I try to feed the child, when I force feed the child, the child vomits. The pressure comes on to the, the teacher, and this has happened to me. I'm being honest about what happened. The pressure is on me, and I've seen it. Other teachers doing it also. I'm not the only one that takes the food and throws it in the bin. So that the parent... Don't complain to the principal and the principal come and complain to you. And then if that parent takes the child out, you get into a lot of trouble because you, you cause the, the school to lose a child. The Holy Spirit that convicts me of this as time went on. The Holy Spirit that convicts me of throwing food away. Because technically it's lying. Even though I didn't say to the parent, listen, I did throw your food away because your child didn't finish it. Just because I didn't say that to the parent and I kept quiet and threw it in the, in the bin, it's still a lie whether I told the parent or not. Because it's deceiving. Now the child goes home. The em lunch boxes are empty. And now the parents think, Ah, oh, what a good teacher. My child did finish all her food today. And they think, Oh, tonight I'm lazy. I don't feel like cooking. Ugh, I won't cook tonight. I'll just give my child a little bit of porridge because my child already ate at school. 
the two hot dogs that I gave, the, the, the rice with stew, the banana, the apple, the yogurt. Ugh. Tonight, I'll just take a break and give my child a little porridge. So this is the danger. The parent thinks the child ate all that food in the day and might be lazy to cook that night and the child doesn't eat supper either. Some parents can't feed their children at home because the child doesn't like eating, puts the supper, the dinner, in a lunchbox, takes it to school and expects the teacher to feed the child because they couldn't do it. The child doesn't want to eat when they feed the child. They expect the teacher to do it. Now you only have so much time to for, for the tea break to be finished, the lunch time to be finished. They eat in the morning, they eat in the afternoon, and you only have so much time. If that child does not want to eat, and it's just sitting with the food in his mouth and not swallowing. And the teacher is under pressure because they don't want parents complaining. That food goes into the bin. The child didn't eat. The child's not eating at home. The child's not eating at school. Because of the deception, the lie. That's why it's better to put the food back in the lunchbox. I mean, to put the food back in the bag. It's better that the parent sees what the child ate, what the child didn't eat, so the parent knows how much food that child did take in that day and what that child must eat in the night to make up for what that child didn't eat in the day. Because some children are not going to eat in the day. Some children want to eat at night. They're not hungry. And they don't want to eat in the day. They don't have an appetite. Some children have a big appetite in the morning and a big appetite at night, but no appetite in the day. Some children don't want to eat breakfast. They don't have an appetite for breakfast. They will be hungry at lunchtime. Everybody is different. That's why the food must go back in the bag and go home. And the parent must not complain if food comes home. It is good when you see food coming home so that you can see, oh, this is what my child didn't eat today. He had his apple, but he didn't eat his nachi. He ate his fruit, but he didn't eat his bread. To force feed a child in the daycare takes up time and it can also be kind of like a power struggle and it can become a, a, um, a struggle and uh, I don't think it's healthy to force a child to eat uh, when they don't want to eat, especially when you see them throwing up and, and, and just bringing it all up. Some, some, some parents think they must eat a lot because the more they eat, the faster they'll grow, or the more they eat, the healthier they will be. Some parents believe that their children must be chubby, that their children must have plump, Meat, they must be a little bit fat. They want their children to have fat cheeks. They want their children to have fat arms and fat legs. And that to them means that their child is healthy. But it's not necessarily the case because your child's stomach is only that small. And to jam pack, jam pack that stomach, it can come up and the child will throw up because you're putting too much stuff down. And maybe that's how the parents are feeding them at home. And so when they get to school, 
they are like taking a break from all of that. They're like, when they see food, they're like, no, leave me alone. I'm so done with this force feeding. I get it at home. Now I must come to school and you want to force feed me at school also. I want to take a break from food. What also happens to children is, what happens is now you, you don't want to lie. Because I got convicted about throwing food, food in the bin. So now I must make sure that the child does eat. The child can't finish in the time that the child is supposed to finish their food. So what do I do? I'll, I put the table nicely there in the corner of the classroom. The children that don't want to eat, I sit them there in the corner of the classroom because it's past the time of the daily routine. We must go on to the next activity, which might be drawing or painting or something. So now these children are still not finished their food. I don't want the parents to complain. So they must sit there with their food while the other children are doing work. While the other children are drawing, while the other children are painting or writing or um, uh, trying to make a puzzle or uh, doing beadwork or whatever the children are now doing, those children are excluded of the activity because they're taking too long to eat. And they can sit there for till nap time. From tea time till nap time to try and finish their food. And whilst I'm busy with the children here, yeah, with their activities, helping them here yeah, to cut, helping them here yeah, to paste, I'm going there and giving a spoon of food, giving a spoon of food. So now they are eating very slowly, but they are finishing their food, but they're not getting any academic input. They're not getting any activities done. Because what's happening today is happening to tomorrow. So this can happen with some children that every day they eat slowly. Some of them, they are looking now, the other children are busy with activities. So I'm going to, tomorrow I'm going to eat faster. Some t children learn. And the next day, they don't want to sit like they did yesterday and watch everybody else do painting. So today they try to eat faster. But then there's some children who really just can't finish their food because their, their parents are jam packed for them. They, the parents gave them too much food. So they're stuck. They're stuck. They can't get out. They're stuck eating. They can't cope. It's too much for them. They're stuck eating while other children are doing other activities because they got jam packed with this and this and this. They must finish all of this food. And the parents think that they are good parents doing that to their child. But they're actually doing harm to their child. Because they are the type of parents that will complain if their child doesn't eat. And the principal doesn't want them to take the child away. So, the child just eats the whole day. Till nap time. To prevent a complaint. Now what is worse, throwing, throwing the food in the bin or making the child sit and not be able to do other activities? It's like, which is the worst devil? Which is the worst wicked thing for a child? This is where the darkness comes into the daycare. This is where things are, are coming dark, dark. Because people love to complain. Even the Israelites in the Old Testament, walking around in the desert for 40 years, all they did do was complain, complain, complain. And some of us still have that Israelites tendency to complain. And this complaints brings other 
um, areas, these complaints allow the devil to come in and do his work. Where there's complaining, the devil is working. His darkness. That's why the Lord says, be thankful and do not complain. Don't give the devil a foot or a toe or access into your life to work his mischief in your life. To curse you somehow. Because murmuring and complaining can cause the devil to do something to you. These parents that are complaining, 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 complaining. They think they're helping their child, complaining to the principal. They think they're helping their child, complaining about the teacher. And they think now we are going to do a better job for their child because they complained. Because they think that they, these, these parents think we don't know what we're doing. They think we don't know how to look after children, but we do it every day. And it's our job. It's like saying to a nurse, you don't know how to do your job. It's like saying to a doctor, you don't know what, what you're doing. I, I think you must do this operation, not that operation. Now you're coming to the school and you're saying, this is wrong and that is wrong. And you want to complain, complain and complain because you are a mother. Because this is what you do at home. But being a mother at home is not the same as looking after 25 children or 30 children in a classroom. It's not the same thing. Because you are looking after one child or maybe two or three. Maybe you have seven children at the most at home. If I, had to, if I had a classroom with seven children, it would be so much easier and so much more practical and it would actually be better than me having a classroom of 25, 30 children on my own with no assistant because this is what's happening. Some principals, they don't have finances. They don't have a strong finance. Or maybe they do have the finances, but they want to hold on to their money. But there's expenses. There's rent. There's paying the teachers. There's water and lights. There's their own rent at home. There's their own expenses at home. Maybe they have to pay school fees for their own children. And all of these things add up. And so they don't bother to get an assistant for the teacher in the classroom. And she alone must look after all 30 children or whatever because there's just no money to pay all these salaries. And then on top of it, that teacher with no assistant must clean the classroom, clean the tables and the chairs, clean the mats that they sleep on, sweep and mop, sweep and mop, sweep and mop. Maybe three times or two times a day. There will be spring cleaning day where the, where the teacher will come in on a Saturday to clean windows, to clean all the, the Lego, to clean all the toy, the, the, the toys, to clean, like, like super clean the place with no extra pay for free after hours. Teach, teachers get exploited. Teachers have to even clean the, the toilet that the whole school is using. They must clean the toilets. They must clean the kitchen. If there's cooking in that school, they must help cut the vegetables, help peel the potatoes. They must do all of this and they must do their, prepare their activities for the children, do the activities with the children, feed the children, Clean the whole, the, like clean the, the kitchen, clean the bathroom, clean the classroom. I've worked in a school and I love gardening. Don't get me wrong. I love working in the garden. But there's daycares where they, the principal even expects you to clean the garden, to work in the garden. Now, I don't mind doing that. I don't mind watering the garden. I don't mind pulling out the weeds and planting and carrying on in the garden. But other teachers don't like it. They don't enjoy gardening. For me, it's not such an issue, to be honest. I love working. 
and I can work hard. I am a worker holic. I don't like sitting still. I like to be busy. I like to be doing. I am a busy person and I like working hard. It's in my blood. But not all the teachers are like that. So you can't do that to all the teachers. There must be a balance. You need to respect your teachers and your child carers. Some of these teachers, there was only one place that I worked where we were allowed to have an hour's lunch break. You don't get a lunch break. The, 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 the teachers, they don't get a break. They must eat whilst they're looking after the children. They must have their cup of coffee whilst they're watching. They're always watching, always working and cleaning. I've seen, it wasn't me myself, but I, I saw a teacher where I worked. She would wash, there was a washing machine. She would wash all the bedding, all the blankets. She would do washing of, of, of clothes. Okay, I would wash clothes if somebody did vomit or wet their pants or something. I will wash it by hand. Hang it up to dry and put it in the bag clean. I won't send dirty clothes back to the mother. I'll clean it. Hang it up. If it's not dry in time, I put it wet back in the bag and say, I did wash it. It just needs to be hung up. It's not dry yet. But this other teacher, she was hardcore, man. She's number one. She washes, but she had a washing machine. The school had a washing machine. She would wash all the blankets. She would have, she'd love washing the blankets. At least once a week, she'd wash all the blankets and hang it up everywhere before she goes home. So that the next day when she comes back to school in the morning, it's dry. It dries overnight. Um, so teachers, they do more than just teaching in a daycare. They clean. They, they, they will wash poo and pee. If a child is potty training and poos in his pants, they will wash it. They will clean the vomit off of the floor. They will clean the vomit off of the child. They will wash the child's clothes. They will wipe the snot off of the child's nose. They will wipe the child's face. Now, this is another thing where parents complain. If you give the child to the parent and the face has got snot on it or it hasn't been wiped. Even if you've been wiping that child's face the whole day. But now, you're in a hurry to get the child to the parent and you were distracted by something else or something happened and you quickly give the child to the parent and you didn't wipe the face before you gave the child to the parent. That parent will complain. You're not looking after my child. My child's face is dirty. But you know you've been cleaning that face the whole day. But now the face is dirty before the child goes home. Or as you're taking the child to the parent, from picking up the child at the daycare to going home, the child had a poo and the nappy. When the parent gets home, the parent says, Ah, oh, your teacher didn't even change my child's nappy. Meantime, that child's nappy was clean when the child left, but the child did have a poo on the way home. And when the child got home, the, the mother saw that the, the nappy is not dirty and she thinks the, the teacher didn't bother to change her child the whole day. Which is not like that. Sometimes it can happen. That a parent, uh, that, a, that, that a teacher didn't change the nappy and gave the child to the parent. Didn't check. Didn't check to see if the, the, the nappy is clean before giving the child to the parent. It can happen like that. 
But that doesn't mean that that child didn't get to change the whole day. Maybe the, 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 the carer didn't think properly, was busy, was distracted with something else. We are human. Sometimes we don't do it perfectly. Sometimes we don't do it right because we are busy with other children. How many children is in your class? And you're supposed to check that nappy before you give it to the parent. So it can happen. But it can also happen that you give the, the child to the parent with a clean nappy and from there going home, the nappy gets dirty, the teacher gets into trouble because of complaining. Then you have parents that don't bring nappies to school and they expect you to change their child with the other parent's nappies. If another parent puts five nappies in the bag, they expect you to take that nappy and change their child who didn't come with a nappy. That's stealing. Now you said this, this child had a poo, what must I do the whole day with a poo nappy? And the, the teacher is tempted to use another parent's nappy. And if you don't use another parent's nappy and you give the child with the same nappy from this morning because there was no nappy in the bag, the parent gets so upset, they take the child out of the school, they take the child to another school and they're like, how can you let my child walk around with a dirty nappy the whole day? Just because I didn't have a nappy in the bag. Why didn't you make a plan? The principal doesn't want to pay for nappies. The principal doesn't want that expense to supply nappies in the day. So you get those parents, those principals that just won't budge. They won't have, they won't go buy nappies and put it somewhere for in case somebody forgets to put the nappy in the bag. They'll be like, no, I'm not going to buy nappies. Some of the principals are like that. And then they're like, no, that child must be staying in that nappy the whole day because why must I pay for that child's nappies? Then they lose the child, then they get upset. Because they also don't want you to use the other parent's nappies. This is where things go wrong in the daycare. Or you have parents, they put the, the nappy in the bag, but they don't put enough nappies in the bag. Maybe your child has more poos in the day than another child. Maybe your child poos three times a day, and the other child only poos once a day. Because not everybody's the same. So you can't just put one nappy, it's not going to be enough. Some parents, they put nappies in the bag, but they don't put any wet wipes. Then you get teachers who are tempted to use other people's wet wipes. Because this one doesn't have a wet wipe. This one doesn't have a cloth. How must you clean it? How must you clean the poo bum with no cloth? No wet wipe. And the parents just expect you to make a plan. And the principal's like, it's not my problem because I'm not paying these expenses. So who pays for it? The teacher. There's a lot of times the teacher takes money out of her pocket where parents are not taking money out of their pocket. And the teacher is already getting a small salary of maybe 2,500 rand a month or 3,000 rand a month. Such a small salary that the teachers are, and educators are getting. That's what's happening to the teachers. They get paid a little bit of money, then from that little bit of money, they must go buy wet wipes. 
because not every classroom has a basin for you to bath the child in, so you can't wash their bum. Not every classroom has that. And you can't always be running outside the classroom because you must be there to watch the children. So you can't be outside the classroom running for water, running for this. You must be inside the classroom as much as possible with the children because you don't have an assistant because you're the only one in the class. Little problems, little things that go wrong. Um, what else is there? I spoke about the nappies. I spoke about children not hurting themselves. Um, I feel like there's a lot of competition between daycares. There's a lot of competition between daycares and... Uh, okay, I just took a little break and I came back. Um, so, I also feel like what's happening in the classroom is that... Uh, There's too much pressure on these little children to be academically advanced. Not all the daycares, but some of the daycares, they put a lot of pressure on the children to read, to write at a very early age. Um, to know the alphabet, to know how to count to a hundred. Um, to write their name at a very early age. Like, they want them to already know how to hold a pencil and to, to, to draw something at two. And... They already want them to be able to read short words at three and to, 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 to read short words and to know the alphabet. And they must already know how to write their name. Um, and write to a hundred. Like they already want them to be able to write their name and to write uh, numbers and that uh, before even going to grade R they want them to be able to write and read short words like cat and mat and dad and sad and glad but they are so I feel like it's too much too soon and the pressure is on the teachers to perform this so that the word of mouth can go out that this is a very good school because the children are coming home and they already know how to, to count to 100. They already know their alphabet. But what they don't know is that this child is sitting in class for many hours in the day having to sit still and learn it when they should be playing, when they should be uh, playing dress up, playing dolls, uh, fantasy play, playing outside. Play is very good for children and it helps them not to get stressed. 
But now they are so academically pressurized that they are inside the classroom learning to count to a hundred. So that they can go home and count to a hundred to their, their parents. So that at graduation, or not at graduation, like at the, the, the end year party or whatever, and you do your little concert, they can recite their, their, their oh, I can count to 100. Everybody's counting to 100 to, to advertise the school for being very academic. When these children are still so small and children are supposed to play and be free and have friends and and for their imagination to be developed and to be creative in dramatizing a fantasy play, exploring their imagination, exploring their storytelling, um, exploring different characters, playing mommy, mommy, playing uh, different characters like granny and doing different things and exploring their senses, playing with uh, a, a flower or playing with sand or playing with um, a, 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 a rough mat or something different than just sitting there trying to remember to count to a hundred. And this is the darkness that's coming into the daycares because daycares are becoming so competitive. They must know all these things early. The sooner they know it, the better your school is. Then your school is better than the other school because their children, they don't know how to read and write yet, but our children, they know how to read and write already at three, but they are sitting and they have to practice writing well, whilst the other children in the other school are playing. Now the child comes home. Maybe the child stays in a small flat. Maybe the child stays in a room. Maybe where the child stays there isn't children and can't play. So they sit in front of the TV because the parents want them to be quiet while they're cooking or busy. So when are these children going to play? When are they going to play? Depending on circumstances and backgrounds and cultures, um, some cultures hold their children inside the house to keep them safe. Other people allow their child to play in the street and meet their friends in the street and go kick the ball in the street and go ride the bicycle in the street and go play in the street. Okay, so now when you get home at 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock in the evening, Whilst mother is cooking supper, you can play a little bit with your friends outside, but then after that you must come inside and eat. And that's the only time you get to play the whole day. And children are designed to play. Now people say, the educator uh, people say that yeah, um, children learn through play. Yes, I like that. I like that concept of learning through play. But are we going to learn through play the whole day and not allow children just to play and be free without having to learn and play? Just play. That's where they learn their social skills. That's where they develop their, their confidence to make friends. That's where they actually develop more confidence getting to know their friends, playing with them outside, going on the jungle gym, going on the swing, playing in the sandpit, kicking the ball, skipping. OK, 
climbing the tree. Climbing the jumbo, jungle jump. Playing with the hula hoop. Going on the push bike. But you must know, when you play outside, you can get hurt. Children can get hurt. I'm not saying they get hurt every day. I'm not saying that they get hurt every week. I'm saying it can happen. Are you going to allow them to play outside and just be free? Or are you just going to learn with play? Learn with play. Learn, like it's, a, it's actually an activity. But you're putting a bit of play with it. But you're still doing an activity. You're still learning to count to ten. You're still learning to know your colors. You're still learning shapes. What about just letting them be themselves and just play? I'm not saying only play the whole day. I'm saying don't exclude play altogether. Um, and don't do it military style where they must now know how to write their name at the age of four. And they have to practice every day this letter and this letter. And some children have a long name, so they have more letters to learn. Some children have a short name, so they get to know their name faster. And then they go home and they're like, oh, I can write my name and I'm only four years old. But that child's been sitting for hours, for weeks, even months learning that thing. When they could have been outside playing and learning so much more through play. Or just play. Because just even just playing with their friends, they are learning social skills. They are learning confidence. They are learning how to do problem solving. Because they are whilst they're playing, there might be a little problem there that they have to sort out. They are learning to forgive. They are learning to get along. They are learning different things. So... Yeah. There's another thing that I want to expose about the darkness of the daycares. Some of these teachers, not all of them, some of these daycare carers, carers of children, are earning 2,500 rand, 3,000 rand, which is even less than a home executive. It's even less than somebody that you pay to come into your home to do your washing, to do your mopping and cleaning, to do your ironing. To do your cooking, it's even less than those privileged people. Um, and I don't understand why this is this is happening because something needs to be done to fix this issue. Um, because the people that's working in the daycare is getting less than a home executive, yet they they require skills. They are required to get a certificate. They are required to study. They are re required to, to get a qualification. Yet, even after their qualification, or during, whilst getting their qualification, or not even having the qualification, they are earning the same. 2,500 Rand, 3,000 Rand. A grade R teacher might get... 4,500 4, rand, 5,000 rand in a daycare crash. I don't know how much they're getting as a great art teacher in a proper big school, but in the little ECD, earning 4, 5, 
to be a great art teacher it's not a lot and then if you're not a great art teacher you're even getting less that now you're getting three thousand rand or two and a half thousand rand because you're working with th uh, three to four year olds so you're not working with the great art class so now you're even earning less than the great art teacher but you're doing a lot of work you are cleaning you are not just cleaning your classroom you are cleaning the kitchen you're cleaning the bathroom the toilets you are looking after the children you are working on your activities you have to study you have to get a qualification not all these educators and teachers are married or have a partner that can look after them not all of these educators or teachers uh, are living with their mother or their sister who can take care of them because if you're earning two and a half thousand rand you still need somebody to help you you're still dependent on somebody to help you to survive to live because the income is too small the income is too small to go pay rent and eat. So what happened to me? There was a season that I was staying in a room. My salary was 4,500 rand to take care of the grade R class. The other teachers in that school were getting less than me. They were getting 2,500 rand. I'm not just speaking for myself. I'm speaking for them also. It's not nice. I was earning 4,500 rand. My rent for my room not even a flat, not even an apartment. My rent for my room was 4,700 rand. After I paid my 4,500 rand for my rent, after I get paid my salary, I still have to get another 200 rand to pay the balance of my rent. I need to find somebody to help me with money so that I can pay my bus fare to get to work in the morning and to get home in the evening. And then after that, I need to find somebody to help me with a food parcel, somebody that can help me with groceries. Every month I am asking for help. Every, every month I'm seeking somebody to help me. And I'm studying for my qualification. I'm working. I'm coming home and I'm studying. I'm doing assignments. And... I had to get this qualification that took, it's not like a few months and you have a, it's not like a two month course or a three month course. It's like a, it takes a year just to get one certificate. Okay. People were judging me. They said, why don't you have two jobs? Where I was working at this particular place was grace. There was still like some mercy. I only had to be there at half, half past seven. Other day case, you have to be at work at half past six. This daycare had grace. You, you, you could go home, I think at five o'clock. Other day case, they expect you to stay till the last parent comes to fetch their child, which can be six o'clock, it can be half past six. 
some parents fetch their children late. And then you still want me to do another job after that. When I'm tired from the whole day. And I must still look after my home and cook. I must still cook. And I must still study. After cleaning, looking after children the whole day. I'm tired when I come home. I must still study. I must still do assignments and I must still uh, cook and clean and bath. But you want me to, to leave my one job to go to another job. And work at another job till 10 or 11 or whatever hours. And then come home. I couldn't do it. It was too much for me to have two jobs. It was Physically impossible. I needed my rest so that the next day I'm not cranky and moody and taking out my frustrations on the people around me and the children because I'm too tired to deal with them. I have to rest. My body needs rest. Why must I be punished? For working hard in the day to go work at another place so that I can eat. And people were judging me and they were actually frustrated with me. And sometimes they would help me for a little bit and they stop helping me. Because they, they get tired of helping me. Because the problem is not getting resolved. It's not like I'm getting an increase. Every month I'm needy. Every month I'm in need. Because my salary is too small. Um, and then what happened was the support was gone from outside. Nobody want to help me anymore. I, I, I fell into a season where I had no more help or support from outside and I, I came to work and I came into the classroom and I was hungry I had no food my child my youngest boy was with me in the same classroom as me at, in this season, he was in the same classroom as me. And so I decided my child needs to eat. And instead of throwing the food in the bin from the children who don't want to eat, I took that food and I fed my child from the lunch boxes. That the parents put in their children's bags. And because my child was eating and I was hungry. I did eat from the lunch boxes. If I say this child doesn't like his sandwich. Doesn't want to eat. I'd take that sandwich and I would eat it. If I say that child doesn't want to eat his banana and doesn't like it. I would take that banana, I would give it to my child, or I would eat it. And so we did survive. And that's how we ate in the month. Just eating the crumbs from the lunch boxes that the children didn't want to have. And it did help me so I don't have parents complaining that their children didn't eat in the day. And in this particular season, there wasn't enough tables and chairs in this classroom. So I let these children sit on the floor and we'd all just sit on the floor and eat from our lunch boxes. Though I didn't have a lunch box, my son didn't have a lunch box. 
but we would eat from their lunch boxes. And then the one, and the, I was, I was a Christian. I was already a Christian doing this. But just because I'm a Christian doesn't mean I'm perfect. And we're all going through our walk in life, getting to know Jesus more. And it was, I think it was a Wednesday night. I'm not sure. Or a Tuesday night. I can't remember. Or a Thursday night. I actually don't know which night it was. But it was the cell group. Which means once a week, the Christians come together from that church and meet at somebody's home. And they have a Bible study there. And so I went to cell group that night. With my son, and there was a prophet that came to visit that cell group. He wasn't there every week, but he was there that night. And it was a very special cell group, very spiritual. And this prophet looked at me and he said to me, God did speak to me. Earlier on, I think he said he's, uh, God spoke to him earlier on in the day before he came to cell group and showed him a vision of somebody wearing this overall because I would, I would, I would like to wear overall when I go to, to work because I'm working with children and I don't want to mess up my nice clothes. But overall, if the child vomits on me or if there's a mess with the paint or something, at least my clothes are not getting messed. So I had an overall that I like to wear to work. And I was wearing that overall at the cell group. And at the cell group, this prophet is saying, I had a vision of you with this overall earlier on. And God showed me a vision of you eating meat off of the floor. Tasty, quality meat. But you were eating off of the floor. You were picking up this meat from the floor and eating it. And he said to me, behind me was all these big windows. And that is exactly the setting during the day in the classroom. Because behind me there was big windows. And I was sitting on the floor eating from the children's lunch boxes. So this prophet had a vision of me eating meat. Though I wasn't eating meat in the classroom, but sometimes there was meat on the sandwiches. But it was just like symbolic that I am eating quality food, but I'm eating it from the ground. And the prophet said to me, Jesus is saying, don't eat off of the floor. Come and sit at the table. And eat with me at the table. Don't eat from the floor. Come sit with me at the table and eat with me at the table. And I just looked at this prophet and I was like, oh. and I've, I felt so grateful that God didn't tell him that I was eating the children's food from their lunch boxes because I was ashamed. I was embarrassed. And I wasn't ready to make such kind of a confession because how are the people going to judge me for doing such a thing? And so I, I felt grateful that the Lord did kind of like also protect me from shame but gave me a message because Jesus loved me 
He doesn't want me to eat off the floor. But Jesus came to me with, he didn't come to me with condemnation. He didn't come to me with a flying lightning bolt. He didn't come to me to humiliate me in front of everyone in the soul group. He came to me in love and lovingly, with his loving kindness, asked me to come and eat with him at the table, to, to stop doing that. Gently and lovingly telling me, stop eating the children's, the children's food from the lunch boxes. Stop it. That's not what I want you to do. That's not what I want from you. I don't want you to, to, to eat the crumbs of other people. This is not what I want for you. You are my daughter. You are a child of the living God. You can't do this. And I know your circumstances are bad. But don't go, don't go that low that you eat off the floor. Eat at the table with me. And I, I went home and I, I was like talking to Jesus and I said, Jesus, you want me to eat at the table with you, but how? How am I going to eat at the table with you? When my income is so small, all my money goes to, to, my, to my rent. I don't even have money to go buy food. And I'm not lazy. There's a scripture in the Bible that says, if you are lazy, you must eat your own fingers. I said, that scripture doesn't apply to me, Jesus. I am not lazy. You know how hard I work every day. You know how tired I am when I get home. You know how I'm looking after those children, teaching them, cleaning up, cleaning up after them, cleaning, working and studying. You know I'm trying my best and yet I can't eat. I said, this is not fair, Jesus. Why is this happening to me? How am I supposed to be eating at the table? Look at my life. Look at my circumstances. And I love working with children. And most of all, what I love most of all, the best part of the day is in the morning when I do the Bible study with the children, when I do prayer with them, when I do Bible study with them, when I do praise and worship with them, when we sing to you in the morning, Lord, I am giving them spiritual food. I'm teaching them the word of God. I'm teaching them the Bible. I'm teaching them to pray. I'm teaching them to sing to you. But I can't eat. I'm doing your kingdom work. But the church doesn't recognize this kingdom work. The principal doesn't recognize this kingdom work. Only you, Jesus, can see me doing this kingdom work and you see me going hungry and you're telling me not to eat the lunchbox food. You're telling me to stop it. Now what am I going to eat? And so I was so frustrated, but I know I must obey Jesus because he used a prophet he came to me and spoke to me through a prophet and told me plainly to stop eating the food from the lunchbox. So I said to Jesus, Jesus, I will stop eating the food from the lunchbox, but I cannot stop feeding my child. I will still give my child food from the lunchboxes, but I won't eat from it. And I just surrendered and I was like, okay, I'm going hungry. I won't eat. I was like, if I die of hunger, at least I did obey you, Jesus, because you sent me a prophet and you told me to stop eating from the lunchbox. So even if I die of hunger, at least I did obey you. Because I was frustrated and honestly speaking, I was angry. 
And so I stopped eating the food. And then I went to church on a Sunday and my cell group leader came up to me after church and I was like thinking of going home now and he stopped me and he said to me, can I ask you something? And I said, yes. And he said to me, can I organize you a food parcel from this church? And I said, yes, please. Thank you. I didn't ask this church for food because I had just left another church who stopped giving me food money. And I stopped going to that church because they stopped helping me and they humiliated me and made me feel like a dog. Like I'm nothing. Like I'm not family. Making me feel like I'm doing something wrong. Like they are condemning me and judging me because I'm not getting a second job or a second income after I'm so working hard and studying. And I was like, what? Do they think I'm a robot? Do they think I'm a machine or something that I can just go on and on and on and on and on? And I'm doing Bible study. I feel like I'm doing the kingdom work, but I feel like the church can't recognize that I'm doing the kingdom work. And so I left the church and I went to another church and I just started going to this new church. And I'm like, I'm never going to ask the church for food again. Look how they treat me. But when this man asked me if I would like a food parcel from the church, I said, yes. I gave in and I said, yes, please. Because I was hungry and I, I didn't know how else am I going to actually eat now. And... He said, you can have this food parcel for as long as you need it. Even if it's a year or two years, we will give it to you every month. And it's like a, a voucher, a ShopRite voucher. And there was maybe like 800 Rand on this voucher every month. And I was like, oh, wow. 800 Rand a month that I can get to ShopRite and eat. But I can't use that money to pay the 200 rand that I still need to pay for my rent every month. That's outstanding. Because the rent is 4.7 and my salary is 4.5. But I was like, wow, at least I can eat. All I, all I have to worry about is the balance of the rent and the, the bus fare. And so, I, I was eating. But after three months, no? I think it was six months. They stopped giving me the food parcel. And once again, I didn't have food because my situation wasn't changing. I was still going to work, working hard, doing the kingdom work in the morning, Bible study, prayer, worship, working hard with the children in the day, studying. I wasn't getting an increase. This is the problem that's happening in the ECDs, in the daycares. Sometimes the principals don't have enough money to pay proper salaries. Some of the classrooms are small, only a few children. Some of the classrooms are big, have a lot of children. 
whatever the reason or case may be, the daycares are copying other daycares. They see that daycare is only paying two five a month. I'm also going to do that. So now it's a trend. Now all the daycares are paying two five or three thousand, and some of the daycares that are paying more. I take my hat off to them. They are being respectful towards their their staff, but it's only a tiny percentage. And you are blessed if you get into a school that can actually pay you a decent salary in a daycare. Because that doesn't happen often. That hardly ever happens. That is a kind principle. I don't know how to I don't know how, how this problem can be fixed. Maybe the government must be in charge of paying all the ECD child carers and teachers a proper salary where they can pay rent even have a car have their own flat not stay in a room have a car be well taken care of let's take care of the educate carers and teachers who are taking care of your children in the day so that you can go Pursue your career and do your job and earn the money that you want to earn or be an entrepreneur and work in your business and earn the money you want to earn. Why not let the educator carers also be taken care of who are taking care of your children? Why are they neglected? Why are they exploited? Why do people look down on people? Who are looking after children. Isn't one of those children your child? Is your child not valuable enough to be taken care of? Is it a job to look down on that someone is looking after your child? I don't understand that mindset. Because children are beautiful gifts from God and 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 educators and teachers need to be taken care of who is doing the job of taking care of your precious children. Even if they are working in a daycare, in an ECD, why is only the teachers in the big schools, primary schools and high schools getting good salaries, getting a flat, getting a car, but the one that's working in the daycare and the, the crash can't even eat? properly and must stay with their mother or must stay with the husband or must stay with the boyfriend or must stay with the sister because they need help to eat because they can't actually look after themselves they need somebody to help them the scripture that I got is Ecclesiastes 12, verses 13 and 14. And it says, The conclusion, when all has been heard, is fear God and keep His commandments. Because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment. Everything which is hidden. Whether it is good or evil. Everything that is hidden. Everything that is kept in the dark. God is going to judge it. Whether it's good or evil. So at the end of the day we must all fear the Lord. And do what is right. Even when no one is looking. Let the Holy Spirit guide you. On the right path. Jesus told me to stop eating the children's food from the lunchbox.
everything that is hidden in the dark. God will judge it. Whether it is good or evil. I'm going to read it again. Ecclesiastes 12 verse 13 and 14. It says the conclusion when all has been heard is fear God and keep his commandments. Because this applies to every person. This applies to the educators. This applies to the teachers. This applies to the principals. This applies to the parents. It also applies to the government. Where we are falling short in taking care of children. Where we are failing them. Where we are not doing it right for whatever excuse we have. God will bring every act to judgment. Where the government is failing the teachers and the educators of daycares. We are not getting a good salary. To the children who are not playing outside enough every day. They must play outside for at least an hour. To be free, not just play outside for 10 minutes or play outside for 15 minutes. They must play outside for an hour properly before coming back inside. To parents that want to constantly complain like the Israelites in the wilderness for that was walking around for 40 years, complaining, complaining. To the government that's not there. To support the principals who are trying to make money and have a sustainable income and profit margin to make it worth their while having a daycare and all the stress that goes with it. They are supposed to have a, a proper profit and not everything that they earn get paid back to the, the salaries of the teachers. Something needs to, to get fixed. Because everything where we are falling short, everything that's hidden in the dark, everywhere where we are going wrong with these children and force feeding them, putting too much uh, pressure on them to, to write their name and to, 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 to count to 100 and all this little darkness that creeps into the daycare. God will bring every act to judgment. Everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. I pray for forgiveness from the Lord for every evil thing, everything that I did wrong in the day case because of Fearing my principle. Sticking to her rules. And. And children suffering under these rules. Because of fear. Everything. Will be brought to judgment. Everything will be brought to judgment. Whether good or evil. That's why I say. To those teachers out there, those educators out there, those principals out there for daycares and playgroups, crashes, ECDs. Repent. Repent of the things that's happening in the darkness. The things that's not spoken about. The things that's not being spoken out. Repent. Repent of the things that is happening to these children. Different forms of abuse. Abuse is not only beating a child and smacking the child that the child gets bruises. That's not actually happening. 
where children are getting beaten and bruised and attacked in the school. But I'm not saying it's not happening at all. Maybe there's a teacher that's unstable, that can lose a temper. That can happen. But it's not... It's not gonna. It's not. It's not an uh, a, a everyday thing. I'm talking about the everyday thing. That's actually a form of child abuse. That children must be quiet all the time. That their their playtime their playtime is minimized. Almost next to nothing. Some schools they don't even play. Some schools they let the children sleep. Their nap time is three hours. Instead of an hour and a half to two hours, their nap time is three hours because they want them to sleep long so that they can have a break. Can't make a child sleep, 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 sleep so that you can have it easy in your classroom. All this darkness, all this darkness in the classroom, not letting children wash their hands. After they've been to the toilet because you want to save the water account. Or you don't want to buy sanitizer. You don't want to put pressure on the parents to bring toiletries every month. Sanitizer, toilet paper, soap. To keep the classroom hygienic. Some daycares, they don't clean their classrooms properly. Because there's nothing to clean with. There's just water. You can only clean the place with water. Because there's no soap. There's no there's no dental. There's no thing to clean with. All these dark things. And then children get sick. Then you have all the, this child's making that child sick. And that child's making that child sick. Because the classroom is, there's no soap for the classroom. There's no uh, detergents for the classroom because the principal wants to save money and don't want to ask the, the parents to buy it because you don't want to harass the parents with all these things that they must buy because they're scared the principals are scared of the parents all these things God is going to bring every act into judgment, everything which is hidden, all these secret evil things that are happening in the daycares, whether it is good or evil. You can't just put your hands in a bucket of water before you eat your food. You need soap to kill the germs. There's a lot of things that daycares are hiding. I have exposed them today to educate you, though you don't know which daycare it is, because I'm not saying it's all the daycares. I've worked in daycares that are sprinkly clean. They are good in that area. They are good in having soap. They are good in harassing parents for uh, sanitizers, dental, toilet paper, soap, everything that they need to clean. To have stationary. Then you have daycares where they don't want to harass the parents. So they don't have soap, they don't have they don't have sanitizer, they don't have detergents, they just wipe things with with water. It's up to the teacher out of a two thousand five hundred rand to go get dental for a classroom or handy andy. Why must she pay for everything? I have worked in a daycare where there are resources, and I've worked in a daycare where there is no resources. Where I had to pay for everything out of my pocket. If there is 25 children in my class, and I want to make a hand puppet, I must go out of my little salary, Go to the shop and buy 25 color paper, 25 uh, 
I must get wool to put on the hair for 25 hand puppets. I must go get the, the glitter to put on there out of my own salary. Otherwise, there's not going to be an arts and craft if it doesn't come out of my pocket because the principal is too scared to ask the parents for resources after they have paid their school fees or daycare fees, whatever you want to call it. So after they pay their daycare fees, they don't want to ask the parents for anything else. And then the teacher must do it. If there's no, some, some, some uh, daycares, they only ask for stationery once a year. So when those crayons are finished, you get teachers that won't buy. So then there's no more activity really. It's just not happening. Because what are you going to draw with? Your finger. The crayons are finished. Some daycares, they have a file for the children. Some daycares don't have a file. Because there's no stationery. So what activities can you do if you don't have paint? If you don't have crayons? If you don't have Play-Doh? If the Lego is finished? What do the children do? They take the Lego home. They put it in their school bag and they take it home. They steal. The children actually steal a lot of things from the school and take it home. They steal toys from the school. They steal little cars from the school. They can steal the Lego. They can steal the Play-Doh. They can steal um, paint. They can even steal crayons and take it home. And then the resources get smaller and smaller because children are even stealing from the school. And the parents don't bring the stuff back. Maybe the parents don't even know that the child stole it. Because parents don't check their children's bags every day. Teachers don't check the bag every day before it goes out of the classroom to see if something was stolen. Sometimes they don't put it in the bag. Sometimes they put it in their jacket pocket. So, resources, I would say every term, get prints, get crowns, get a new batch of paint, get a ream of paper, give it to the school, even if they don't ask for it. Just give it. I've heard children tell me, I asked the children, did you ask your mom to buy you new crayons because your, your pencil crayons are finished? The child says to me, yes, I did ask my mommy for new crayons, but she said she's not going to buy me new crayons because she doesn't want me to share my crayons with all the other children. So she doesn't buy it. And so the other parent has the same attitude. And the other parent has the same attitude. Why not put it all together in one thing and let them all share it? L let it be like a charity contribution and not be like an ownership mindset. Let it be like a charity contribution so that the parents who didn't do their duty in buying crayons, that child can still draw, that child can still paint. Let it go into one closet to store paint, to store crayons, to store print, to store scissors, to store color paper, things to make arts and crafts, anything that you can bring from Rome, toilet rolls, something to add to arts and crafts so that it doesn't all rest on the teacher's shoulders. When she wants to do something, now she must pay out of her pocket. I've paid for so many things out of my pocket. Pencil crayons, prints, paint, paint brushes. Out of my own pocket, out of my own different seasons of my life. We have different circumstances where I did have some money. I did pay for it myself because... The little bit of my food money I use 
to get crayons for my classroom so that I can do work with them. Because none of the parents want to bring crayons to school. And you have to fight with the parents to get the pencils. You have to fight with them to get the paint. You have to fight with them to get the, the prints. Because they don't want to do it. Because they, they feel like, okay, when I bring my crayons to school, when I bring my prints to school, all the other children is going to use it up. Yes, they are going to use it up. Because their parents didn't supply it. There's nothing in the classroom. There are no resources. Nobody is supporting the classroom's resources. That is why everybody is using it up. But if everybody can have this mindset, we are going to put it in one closet, and yes, we are going to share it with all the children. Then it can alleviate this fear, oh, if I buy my child's pencil crayons, all these friends are going to use it. Yes, let it be so. Because how else are we going to have activities in the classroom? How else are we? Contribute it. Have a charitable heart. Um, contribute charity to the classroom. When it comes to resources, when it comes to pencils and crayons and paint, because how else are we supposed to do anything in the classroom if we don't have anything to do it with? There's the other daycare that I worked in, had a lot of resources. That principal was very mindful of going to the store herself and buying the stuff that the classroom needed. She didn't get the stationery from the parents. She would get like money from the parents and go buy it herself and put it in the classroom like a, 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 a bulk contribution to the classroom. And it worked very well like that. It was successful. And another school, the teacher, uh, the principal also had a bulk, uh, one closet where everybody contributed to wet wipes, everybody contributed to uh, toilet paper, everybody con contributed to a uh, sanitizer. And so that um, uh, toiletries closet was like a bulk charitable contribution for the school. And the school would use it when that cupboard gets empty, that principal would take a picture of the cupboard, of the shelves getting empty and making a statement saying, oh, we're running out of sanitizer. We are running out of toilet paper. And then parents would still come again and get more toilet paper, more tissue boxes, more detergents. And, the, and then she'd take a picture and say, look, it's full. Thank you very much for your contributions. Now we can continue. And so it wasn't like I'm stealing another parent's wet wipes because it was a bulk contribution for the classroom. Transparent and open charitable contribution for the classroom when it gets empty. Whoever has that can add to the basket, it gets filled up and we can function and the classroom can flow and it can be clean. That, that was a very good uh, a, a, a arrangement because that classroom was always very clean and properly cleansed and the, the children getting sick was minimized. The children wasn't as sick because it was very hygienic. Because they didn't say, this is my detail. This is my hand. They did do it as a group. And the parent that doesn't have, that child is still, classroom is still clean. The parent that does have, that's got more, or more of an open heart, or has more, at least at the end of the day, the classroom is clean. With proper detergents, toilet paper, proper things, hand sanitizer, proper cleaning material, to wash the tables and the chairs, to clean the mats, to, to mop the floor with soap, with, with handy Andy or whatever. 
or bleach, proper things to clean and to kill the germs. So, all these things, what I can say is that there's good and there's bad in every daycare. Some daycares are better at cleaning, other daycares have more resources, other daycares don't have. They're not all the same. I'm just opening up and, and, and educating you about what's happening in the dark that's not been spoken about, that's not been spoken about. So I have to finish up because of time, but uh, one last thing that is happening in the daycare that's in the dark is that when things go wrong, like the educator or the teacher or the principal or somebody takes note in the, uh, in the school um, of, uh, of a child that is behaving very uh, sexual or has a learning disability or has emotional behavioral problems. Some of, the par uh, some of the principals of these daycares are too scared to confront the parent and to tell the parent, listen, I need a meeting with you. I need to talk to you about your child. Your child is behaving strangely. Your child has sexual tendencies. This is what we've noted this is what we've ob observed because they're scared that the parents are going to take offense, that the, that the parents are not going to receive what they are saying in a good and healthy way and that the parents might even get angry or embarrassed and take their child to another school and then they lose the child and they lose that that um, daycare fee every month <sighs> or they can blame the school they're scared that the, the parents are going to blame the school and put the blame on the school that their child has got sexual tendencies When these children actually need counseling, when these things actually need to be addressed, it is swept under the rug and hidden and not talked about and not discussed and not confronted. When these children actually need counseling, some of the principals are, are, are scared that they are going to get arrested if a child did something sexual in the classroom and it wasn't stopped in time. Sometimes something can happen so quick. But, they, but there's so much pressure on the teachers and educators, child carers, there's so much pressure that before that thing happens, the teacher must be already there to, to stop it. That's the expectation of child carers. But sometimes it happens so quickly and you're not there on time to stop something. And then it's hush-hushed and it's kept a secret because the principal's scared that someone's going to get uh, arrested or locked up or go to jail for not stopping that sexual uh, activity on time. Instead of addressing it, taking it to the parents, taking it, asking the parents to take the child or getting the parents um, involved um, in, in, in getting uh, the child to a counsellor, to get proper counselling for the child, to get help for the child, 
to find out why is this child doing this. There are children in the daycares. They are so small. They are so young. And they know about sex. Where did they get it from? How did they learn it? But yet there's no investigation done in fear of how the parents are going to react. There can be a child with a learning disability, but the principal is too scared to tell the parents in fear of how the parent is going to react. Is the, is the parent going to be defensive? Is the parent going to say, no, there's nothing wrong with my child? Why are you saying, and start attacking the school because saying, no, you, got, you don't know how to teach my child. There's nothing wrong with my child's brain. Or becoming like attacking the school now when we are trying to help. When we, we're not saying that there's something wrong. We're just saying, the, the principal's even scared to say, we don't, we don't say that your child has a learning disability, but we are advising that you take your child to a professional to check, to see if your child might have a learning disability. But the principal is even scared to do it like that in fear of how the parent is going to react. So it's hush-hushed, it's kept a secret. We just carry on with our routine, with the day, and trying to teach the child, child everything we must teach the child. But the child's not learning it because the child can't focus. The child is can't sit on, can't sit like everybody else. The child is not doing anything, and it's kept a secret because that principal wants that daycare money from the parent every month. That, that principal doesn't want to lose her income. In fear of how the parent's going to react. So the child is not getting the help that the child needs. The child's not getting the counseling. The child's not getting the help. The child's not getting everything. Because some principles of are dependent on the daycare's um, uh, profit to survive, to pay for their own rent, to pay for their own household. They would don't want to lose money. It's all about money. And the scripture says here in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13 to 14, the conclusion when all has been heard is fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. I pray that this issue i don't know if this is an issue over uh, in, in other countries um, i'm staying in south africa this is an issue that i have experienced in my location in cape town south africa so i'm not saying that this is happening in other areas of the world. I'm just saying this is what's happening, what I've seen, what I've experienced. Um, I cannot speak on behalf of all the day kids and all the crashes. I'm just ex explaining what I've seen happening. And what I've noticed at every single day kid, Every single one of them. Without the principal, there was one principal that was also doing it. 
And the other day case, the principal was not doing it, was not aware. But the teachers were secretly, the educators were secretly eating the children's food from the lunch boxes. Just like I was doing it. I wasn't the only one doing it. They were, they were going through, they, were, they will eat it because they are hungry. Maybe they're also struggling to buy food. Maybe they just want to eat it because it looks nice. Not everybody has a conscience about it. So it's like, I'll have it. Child doesn't want to eat it anyway. They, they tell themselves, whatever they want to tell themselves, that it's okay to eat the children's food, to eat their snacks, to eat their packet of chips, to eat their yogurt, to, to eat their sandwich, to eat their apple, even to drink their juice. The teachers, the educators have convinced themselves that it's okay to do that. I've seen it at every single daycare. Every daycare I've seen that happening. But not the principals. Only one principal was also doing it. She was also eating from the lunch boxes. She, if she sees a packet of chips that she likes, she will eat it. This is what's happening in the daycare. So I have now, I think I have spoken about everything that I can possibly think of that is happening in the daycare. Uh, yes, that is everything I can think of right now. I hope I've covered everything because the purpose of this video is to talk about what's hidden in the daycare and I'm hoping that there will be some resolution to these issues, that these issues can be addressed and resolved. And I also pray and, and hope that people re will repent and will acknowledge that they are not perfect carers. There's no perfect mother. There's no perfect dad. There is no perfect teacher. There is no perfect educator. Nobody is perfect. Only Jesus is perfect. And because nobody is perfect, we need to look at ourselves and what we are doing to children and ask God to forgive us. We must repent. We must say we are sorry and we must grow from there and stop doing the things that we are doing wrong to children and become better carers and become better at it because yes we're not beating them black and blue but there are types of abuse that's subtle that's almost normalized that is normalized and we need to repent and we need to say sorry god for doing this to this child. Sorry, God, for doing this in my classroom. Sorry, Jesus. Help me to be better in taking care of these children. Help me. Shape me. Jesus is our potter, and we are the clay. And when we repent, and when we ask God and say we are sorry for something, and we really are sorry from the bottom of our heart. He can help us to become better. To stop doing the things that are bad for children. I stopped eating from the lunch boxes. There are things that I did that I stopped. It's a process. But you need to be in that understanding that you're not a perfect carer. If you think you're a perf perfect carer of children, you will never be able to acknowledge that you're doing something wrong to them. And if you can never acknowledge anything that you're doing wrong to them, 
How are you going to grow and become better carers? How are you going to say, I'm sorry for making the children sleep for three hours? If you think you're the perfect carer and you can do no wrong to children. How are you going to, to be able to say, I'm sorry, I'm not a perfect carer. I must allow children to play outside and enjoy themselves for at least an hour. Let it all come out of their system. Let them be free before we do our next activity. If you think you're a perfect carer and you see and you claim you, you do, do no wrong to children, you are not going to grow in becoming a better carer for children. Because nobody is perfect and we all have something we need to work on. We all have something we need to better ourselves in. And we can do that with the help of Jesus. We can do that with the help of the Holy Spirit. I just want to pray and say, thank you, Lord, for this video. Thank you, Lord, that we can talk about these things. And I pray that who's ever watching this video, Lord, I pray that there will be a solution to all the issues in the daycares. I pray that the teachers and educators that are working in the daycares and the creches and the playgroups will get a, a comfortable salary to live A, 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 a normal, balanced lifestyle of earning a salary that will pay for their, their flat, their car, that they can eat, that they can have clothes, that they can live comfortably while taking care of children. I pray that all the issues in the daycare get resolved, addressed, confronted, that strategies and planning take place and to prevent these things from happening that is going wrong in the daycare. I pray for the light to come into the daycare and the darkness to run away from the daycare. I pray that Jesus' light shine in all the daycares and that the darkness flee from the daycare. I pray for an end to lies and deceptions in the daycare. I pray, I pray for open and transparency to happen in the daycares. I pray for the parents not to put so much pressure on the teachers and child carers and principals, that the parents will stop complaining so much and give more support to the daycares, give more charity to the, to, to the daycares and the classrooms that there will be enough resources in the classrooms, enough pencils, enough crayons, enough paint, enough Play-Doh, and even contribute toys to the classroom. Contribute what you can to the classroom. Contribute clothes for the children who don't have clothes. I pray for parents to be become more charitable and to give more to the classrooms besides the daycare money every month that the parents will give what they can. And I pray that the government will step in and support the daycares more effectively. I pray that there won't be so much pressure on the children to be academically advanced before their age. I pray that the children will play more and, and, and do be less pressurized academically, but be played because, because they, are, they are children. I pray that they don't oversleep and I pray that they are not force fed. I pray that if a child has been sexually abused or have sexual tendencies, that that child will get help. If a child has behavioral problems, that that child will get help. If that 
child has learning problems, that that child will get help. I pray that the principals will be motivated to have daycares because they will still earn a sustainable profit income, that their profit margin will be large enough for them to be motivated to have daycares. Because what are we going to do without daycares? Where are we going to take our children? Who's going to look after them when we want to go to work, when we want to go run our business? So the principal must also benefit out of this whole thing. And the principal needs to be supported. The entrepreneur also needs support to be motivated to have a daycare, to earn a profit, a business entrepreneurial profit, to earn a happy profit. The teachers and educators to earn a good income. The classrooms to be supported with enough stationery, that there be enough toiletries and cleaning, facil uh, cleaning facilities and cleaning detergents. I pray that the light shine in the classrooms of the daycares, that the light shine in the daycares, on the playgrounds, in the classrooms, in the daycares, in the lives of the people that are working in the daycares. I pray for Jesus' light to shine forth and that the darkness flee from our children who are precious and beautiful. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for watching.